the 1941 World Series. The Yankees have a 2-1 game lead over the Brooklyn Dodgers. But in the fourth game, it's the top of the ninth, and Brooklyn's looking good with a 4-3 lead. The Yankees are up with two men out. Tommy Hendricks swings and misses, but Dodger Mickey Owen muffs the catch. It's a passed ball. Hendrick gets to first, leaving the door wide open for DiMaggio, Keller, and Dickey. The Yanks finish the inning three runs ahead. The Dodgers go down in order, and it's the Yanks game, 7-4. Mickey Owen is charged with the only error of the game. The win gives the Yankees a 3-1 game lead, and the series ends the next day with a Yankee victory. Army Notre Dame football rivalry goes back to 1913. One of the most memorable clashes took place at Yankee Stadium in November 1944. Army, which had not won against Notre Dame for 13 years, avenged its long humiliation by crushing Notre Dame 59 to nothing. Notre Dame, of course, had lost its entire squad to the draft that year. The war in Europe and the Pacific was in its final fury. But Army could still call on some of the best football talent. These men were legitimately being trained at West Point for combat leadership. But some of the more vociferous Notre Dame fans chose to make an issue of their draft status. The Army players were subjected to slanderous abuse. In turn, the cadets worked themselves into a competitive frenzy and kept scoring and scoring. Some of the more rabid Notre Dame partisans saw it as a deliberate humiliation and even spread the curious notion that to cheer for Army was somehow to be anti-Catholic. The hate-filled game of 1944 was followed by two more, equally bitter, which finally led West Point officials to call off the series for 10 years. The year before, Army, after losing 13 straight games to Notre Dame, had crushed its traditional rival 59 to nothing. Now it was 1945. Army had the talented Glenn davis doc Blanchard combination on the field. Watch number 41, Glenn Davis, go for a 25-yard game. And Doc Blanchard, number 35, for 18 yards. Blanchard Davis, the legendary Mr. Inside and Mr. Outside of college football in the mid-40s. But the Army-Notre Dame rivalry had in 1945 degenerated into a hate campaign, with Army accused of using West Point priorities to enlist the best football talent in wartime, and Notre Dame fans indulging in extreme partisanship, extending even in the case of some fans to religious bigotry, as the Irish started to lose their supremacy in the 40-year rivalry with West Point. In 1945, Army again overwhelmed Notre Dame 48 to nothing, but the annual skirmish had sunk to the level of a neighborhood brawl, which not even the wizardry of Davis and Blanchard could rescue. After 1947, the traditional Army Notre Dame game was canceled to be resumed only 10 years later in a more sportsmanlike atmosphere. They'll never stop arguing this one. 80,000 in Cleveland Stadium. Notre Dame's Francis Dansewis whipped an aerial to Bob Scoglund, and he went on to the Navy 25. Frank Ruggiero went pile driving off tackle to score, and it was Notre Dame 6, Navy nothing at the half. But Dansewitz took to the air once too often in the second half. The ball bounced off Scoglund's back, and Clyde Scott took it on the run. The Swifty from smack over Arkansas was too fast to catch, and Navy tied it 6 all. Now the disputed play. 
Dancewitz passed to Phil Colella, and Tony Manisi wrestled him out at the goal. Did he score or not? The officials said no. Sports writers almost unanimously agreed after viewing these films. Navy refused to yield another inch, and it was a sensational tie, six all. The 1946 World Series was a seesaw affair between the Boston Red Sox and the St. Louis Cardinals, tied three games apiece by the seventh and deciding game. At the bottom of the eighth, it was a 3-3 tie when card Eno Slaughter set the stage with a single. Harry Walker doubled. Slaughter tore around the bases. Shortstop Pesky went out to take the relay hesitated a split second looking for Slaughter at third, but Slaughter was headed home and Pesky's throw was late. Pesky's pause was seen again and again on replay. All eyes on the shortstop. There. That fraction of a second, fatal to Boston, gave the Cardinals the series. March 9, 1946. The stands were packed for the Santa Anita handicap with 23 horses in the field. But it wasn't the start that made this race memorable. Coming to the finish line, it was Snow Boots leading in the stretch, War Knight second, Bail Bomb third, and First Fiddle coming up outside to what looked like a four-horse dead heat. They raced right into a photo finish. And here it is again. Allowing for the camera angle slightly short of the finish line, it was War Knight, second from the camera first, first fiddle this side, second, Snow Boots third, and Bail Bond on the rail, fourth. For War Knight's fans, a snapshot well worth waiting for. Nineteen forty seven army undefeated in 32 straight games spanning over three years was going to make mincemeat of puny Columbia army led 16 to nothing after just a few minutes of play but those wily Columbia Lions figured well they had nothing to lose so they took to the air again and again in the last quarter, trailing 20 to 7, they made sports history. Rosinas to Suyaki, a long one to Army's 5, leading to a touchdown on the next play. Army 20, Columbia 14. When the cadets drop back to intercept Rosinas' runs, when they close in, he passes. There goes a long one, and a circus catch by Bill Suyaki on Army's 4-yard line. And Columbia plunges over for a touchdown. With six and a half minutes left in the game, it's the kick and the upset of 1947. Columbia 21, Army 20. None who were there will ever forget it. Baseball's Hall of Fame made him its first black member, Jackie Robinson, who first broke the color barrier in Major League Baseball, a household name as a star hitter for the then Brooklyn Dodgers. From 1947 to 1956, Jackie's Dodgers won pennants in six of his ten seasons. But almost forgotten is the fact that he was a star football player as well at UCLA in the late 1930s. Watch him in a spectacular runback, leading UCLA to a 16-6 victory over Oregon on October 28, 1939. Touchdown for Jackie Robinson.
It was the fourth game of the 1947 World Series. Last of the ninth and Yankee Bill Bevins was close to pitching the first no-hitter in World Series history. Dodger Cookie Lavagetta was sent up to pinch hit with two on and two out against a 2-1 Yankee lead. Bevins was one out away from baseball immortality. But that was as close as Bevins ever came. Lavagetto banged the next pitch against the right field fence for a double. Two Dodgers scored, and Brooklyn had tied the series in one of the most exciting finishes ever seen in Ebbets Field. It was the sixth game of the 1947 World Series, and the Yankees were leading three games to two. Joe DiMaggio came to bat with a chance to end the series with a Yankee victory, but Dodger Al Gianfrido made a magnificent catch. Brooklyn held off the Yankees, and the series was tied again. The seventh and deciding game, Brooklyn was ahead two to one, but in the fourth, the Yankees were threatening Hal Gregg. Bobby Brown doubled Johnson home, that tied the score, and by the seventh, the Yanks had moved ahead four to two. Fireman Hugh Casey took over for Brooklyn. Johnson hit a towering drive to left. He was up there a mile. Eddie Mixis lost it in the sun. It fell for a triple, and with it fell Brooklyn's chances. When the Dodgers came up in the ninth, Edwards bounced into a double play, and it was all over. It would be another eight years and three tries before Brooklyn finally took their first World Series from the New York Yankees. The running of the 400-meter relay in the 1948 London Olympics was the scene of the biggest controversy of the Games. The debate centered around the first baton pass from Barney Ewell to Lorenzo Wright. The race itself was never in doubt, as the Americans took an early lead. Harrison Dillard, running the third leg, was confident as he passed off to Mel Patton, considered the world's fastest human, who raced for the wire. The U.S. speedsters won by a comfortable six yards. But officials gave the gold to second place Great Britain. Judges ruled that the U.S. had made an illegal pass outside the 20-meter zone. The Americans protested. Official films proved that the pass was indeed made within the chalk lines. The gold was returned to its rightful owners. Well, it didn't figure to be much of a contest when President Truman tossed the coin with 103,000 watching. Navy hadn't won a game all season. Army hadn't lost. But before the crowd settled down, Pistol Pete Williams exploded over his port bow and went steaming along for 60 yards to Army's 11-yard line. A few plays later, Bay Singer banged over and the middies led. When Army recovered from the shock, Arnold Galiffa sent a high, arching pass to Dave Parrish, and the cadets knocked on the door. Harold Schultz blasted over and evened the score. In the seesaw battle, Galiffa bootlegged the ball around right end for a last quarter touchdown, and it looked like Army's game 21 to 14. The president's daughter Margaret cheers while the middies mourn. That looked like the end, but Bill Hawkins drove over the goal for Navy again in the dying minutes. Still that extra point. Roger Drew hadn't missed all season. He didn't miss this one. Underdog Navy tied Army 21 all. Richard Pancho Gonzalez and Ted Schroeder in the final match of the U.S. National Tennis Championship, September 5, 1949. 
The first set went 34 games before Schroeder won it. And Schroeder went on to win the second set 6-2. Time and time again, passing Gonzalez easily. Then Gonzalez fought back and took the next two sets, 6-1, 6-2. Watch Gonzalez put this one away. In the final set, with a score of 5-4, Gonzalez serving, came the closest call ever made on a championship match point. Keep your eyes on the far right sideline. Schroeder drives out, and the tournament goes to Gonzalez. Here's a replay of that famous shot that made tennis history in 1949, and started young Gonzalez on a spectacular career as one of the best players of all time. There it goes. What a heartbreaker for Ted Schroeder. Pancho Gonzalez, of poor Mexican immigrant parents, went on to become one of the first players to prove that tennis was a game for the poor as well as the rich. It was the 75th anniversary of the Kentucky Derby. May 6, 1949, when number five, the favorite Olympian, charged into the lead. Then suddenly, from his dead last position, number three, Ponder, thundered around the outside to win, going away. Seven years later, history had a chance to repeat itself when Needles, son of Ponder, came onto the Kentucky Derby track wearing the same number three. Ben A. Jones took the early lead. With 17 horses running, Needles was next to last. Then, just like his father before him, Needles threaded his way through the traffic and came pounding down the stretch to the finish line. And like father, like son, it was Needles in the winner's circle. On the last day of the 1949 season, Brooklyn had to beat the young Philadelphia Phillies to win the pennant. Tied 7-7, the game went into extra innings. Then in the 10th, Dodger Pee Wee Reese got on base with a looping single. A few minutes later, he came home on Duke Snyder's hit, and Brooklyn became the National League champs of 49. An old team with rookie players, the Phillies were left in third place 16 games out. But by spring training 1950, the Whiz kids seemed to have magic in their bats. And that fall, the pennant race had a different ring to it. Once again, it was Brooklyn versus Philadelphia. But this time, it was for the National League title. At the end of the ninth, they were tied one all. Then in the 10th, the Phillies took advantage of their second chance. With two on, Dick Sisler hit a long drive to left that soared into the stands. A home run that gave Philadelphia its first National League victory in 35 years. 